You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about sports in the state of Michigan? You can't handle the truth! Well, we're giving you the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media, the show that provides research and statistics about all the Detroit and Michigan sports teams, whether fans like it or not, and detects, exposes, and reveals actual and hidden facts and truth that the mainstream media doesn't want you to know. No junk, no entertainment, no homerism, no slappiness, no coddling, no pop culture, no conspiracy theories, no opinions, no shilling, and no fluff. Head over to our website, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast, podcast.com follow us on twitter periscope and instagram at michigan underscore truth and like and share our verified facebook page the michigan sports truth podcast also listen to us on spreaker Castbox, iHeartRadio, google podcast apple podcast via itunes and spotify and like staples media on facebook <laughs> The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers, nor does it represent or compete against any mainstream media in the state of Michigan. It is also not for entertainment or debating purposes. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And it is for every sports fan's own good because the truth is out there. And welcome to another episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media. Taylor Phillips here along with Ed Smith and Frank Vazier. Follow me on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at DT2Phillips. Follow Ed Smith on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at EdSmith313. And follow Frank Vazner on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at Frank underscore Vazner. It's time for our opening statement, my opening statement. The football searches in our state have come to an end. Ed, we'll start with you, and then we'll go to Frank. Opening statement, please. Well, I guess, you know, if I can sum up today, I'll say that the, there's two opening statements. One, that, yes, indeed, there is another new day in the city of Detroit for the Lions, and it appears that the Wolverines of Michigan may be back on track after a minor setback. Absolutely, yes. Frank, opening statement. My opening statement is, it's a new era in Detroit for football, and maybe, just maybe, we may actually be experiencing a much-needed rebuild with the Lions, given the way the contracts of new GM and new head coach are structured, which we'll get into later. All right, but before we get started, we want to remind everyone to download the all-new social sports app called Vig It, which influences more and more people to love sports. Enter the referral code STABLES when you sign up, available on the Apple App Store and Google Play. Download the Bigot app and sign up with a referral code Stables. Special announcement, Michigan users can pre-register with Bigot's partner, BetMGM. Yes, Bigot has partnered with BetMGM, and Michigan users can deposit then a minimum of $10 in exchange for 2,000 extra Big coins. Again, download the Bigot app, available on the Apple App Store and Google Play, and sign up with a referral code Stables for Stables Media. Capital S at the beginning, lowercase letter B in the middle. Pretty good offer, huh, guys? Absolutely it is, especially since the online betting will go live on Friday at noon in time for conference championship weekend in the NFL. Absolutely. Yeah. Timing. Yep. And let's get started with football, the Michigan Wolverines, with our What's Your Great segment. Pencils down, everyone. It's time to find out what's your grade. The Michigan Wolverines football team has hired Baltimore Ravens linebackers coach Mike McDonald as their new defensive coordinator. Ed, we'll start with you. Then we'll go to Frank. Ed, what's your grade on Mike McDonald? Uh, I have to say, knowing for a fact that he was, um, until just, just recently, the defensive coordinator for the Baltimore Ravens, someone tells me this was a move that this was going to happen in terms of Michigan getting help for the defensive side of the football. If you can remember back in 2011 when Brady Hook was brought in, what did he do? He brought in Greg Madison from the NFL, uh, or at least, you know, from his experience of working in the NFL. I think he's going to take that ta- uh, that type of caliber of, of coach and coordinator to help out on the defense. Yes, some players may have left, but still, there's no excuse for what happened with the way Don Brown had in those last couple of years. So uh, it was interesting to see um, how the coaches around him work. For example, they are of a new cornerbacks coach and uh, Maurice Linguist replacing Mike Zolik, for example. So that could be another example of, of not just one coordinator being in charge of the, of the squad, of the unit, but a multitude of coaches, say, for example, with this hire, the defensive ass coach. So long story short, I would say my rigging, my 
think it ranking would probably be a B plus. But again, we gotta see how what what else he does on the job from here from this point forward. Yeah, a Vigit ranking grade. That is an awesome idea, Ed. You just brought it up to us on the air. Thanks very much. Frank, what's your grade on Mike McDonald? I'm gonna give this a B with the opportunity to possibly get higher depending on how the results are. Obviously McDonald comes in having a Worked in the NFL, linebackers coach with the Ravens. Now he's going to come to the college ranks. Now, what's interesting about this hire and also bringing in Maurice Linguist, who is the defensive backs coach with the Dallas Cowboys, is that Michigan has seemingly done what Ohio State has done with some of their coordinators and bringing in assistants at the NFL level, whether they were position coaches or defensive analysts or anything of that nature and look at the success that they've had so well, at this point given the fact that teams like ohio state have beaten up on you so long and so badly maybe you need to start doing what they do and what the other big boys do in order to get back to that level so i'm going to give this a b because i know mcdonald has never been a coordinator and call plays on a defense before the same can be said for linguists but you know the fact that they're going to Reaching the NFL, guys that know what it takes to get there and know how to play, this is going to have a chance to grow, so I'm going to give it a B. All right, so we'll all give it a B for Mike McDonald. Next up, they've hired Dallas Cowboys defensive backs coach Maurice Linguist as a co-defensive coordinator. So guys, we'll go to Ed and then Frank again. Michigan's going to have two defensive coordinators instead of one. Ed, what's your grade on Maurice Linguist? Well, knowing the fact that Maurice Linguist was part of the Cowboys defensive coordinator, coaching staff for a number of years as of late one of the positive things that i mentioned about or that I could say about was the cowboys defensive secondary whether it be from i believe it was xavier woods at one point and then of course to um i just mentioned michigan earlier but again bears witnessed uh how good their defensive coordinators their cornerbacks used to be uh, Jordan Lewis was one example. So it shows of how, you know, the, as, as much as people want to talk about the strengths that the Cowboys had offensively, people shouldn't even forget it was their defense you know, up until this year and had them in a lot of games. It was a big reason why they won those games to begin with. It wasn't just Dak or Zeke. It was guys on the defensive front and especially in the secondary as well. So I think with that repertoire that he's bringing or has brought to Dallas, it could help out very well for Michigan in terms of what their secondary being as poor as it, as it has been the past couple of years. I understand talent graduating going to the NFL, but still, that's no excuse for that. So knowing the potential of what he could be, what he could bring to the secondary position, I'm going to give this one an A-. minus. All right, an A-. minus. Yeah, love to hear that. Frank? I am actually going to give my grade for linguist a little bit higher at the B+, plus, but with an opportunity to get that's better lower. as well. Yeah, well, it's higher than the grade I gave for McDonald's is what I meant. But oh, right, right, right. right. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, from I was going to say it's lower than Ed's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm giving it a B plus because again, defensive backs coach with the Dallas Cowboys. But I also did read that he was a defensive backs coach at the University of Minnesota a few years ago when their pass defense was, I believe, in the top. 20 nationally if i read that correctly and michigan's achilles heel was their pass defense this year as they ranked in the 90s this year and that's not going to cut it if you're playing in the big 10 or anywhere as i made reference to ohio state bringing in guys from the nfl to be their defensive coordinators jeff halfley was actually brought in from the san francisco 49ers as a defensive backs coach so again michigan following that model bring in an NFL position coach to run the defense. Now they got two of them. And Linguist, I think, is I'm a little bit higher on because he's got a little bit more experience coaching in college and working with defensive backs. And I think that's going to help Michigan's pass defense. So that's why I'm giving it a B-plus for now. But again, this has the opportunity to grow higher and higher with results. Yes, it does. Hard for me to range it. So, uh, Frank, I'm a tough choice, but I'm going to decide with you on that one. A B plus between a B plus and an A minus, kind of like an 89 percent, just a B plus. Also, they've uh, hired safeties coach George Hilo from Maryland. Ed, we'll go to you. Go to you, and then we'll go to Frank. Ed, what is your grade on George Hilo? Uh, my grade on George Hilo. All right, if I could give a grade on George Hilo, I'd probably be 
um, a B as well, because uh, I think with uh, uh, it, it was expected for um, excuse me, this is about the Lions, the, the defensive coordinator hired, correct? Just make sure I heard this correctly. This is about uh, who Michigan brought in as their safeties coach. Oh, their safeties coach. Okay, my apologies. Yes. Hmm. I thought I heard something else about the uh, defensive coordinators, Coach. Could you repeat the question again, please? I'm sorry. Oh, defensive coordinators? Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, we already uh, graded Mike McDonald and Maurice Linguist. So, uh, George Hilo, yeah, he's got to be their uh, safeties coach. Ah, okay. Yeah. That makes sense because, you know, the, uh, the the back end of the secondary got torched a lot, too. Whether or not they offered safety help, it didn't matter. Um their they secondaries have. got got tore up a lot, so I think this I like this move as well. I give this one a B plus. All right, B plus from Ed Smith. Frank, your turn. I'm in the same boat with that. I think that George Hilo is an upgrade over Bob Shoup, who was their previous safeties coach. And from what I'd heard, that the safeties had not been playing well, so he got an upgrade there. But again, that really wasn't saying much, given the fact how bad Michigan's pass defense was. But I think with Linguist also coaching the corners and Hilo coach the safeties. That's going to be much better than what they had previously with Shoop and Michael Zordich. So I'm going to give this one a B plus again with the opportunity to improve with results. All right. A couple notes here in terms of Michigan Wolverines football. Former ESPN 300 running back for the Michigan Wolverines, Zach Charbonnet, has entered the transfer portal. And Chris Evans, their other running back, will enter the NFL draft. So, Ed, we'll go to you and then we'll go to Frank. Uh, Ed, uh, the Wolverines have just lost uh, two good running backs. That is true, but that's the case with with any program. You can never have enough running backs, so this doesn't surprise me, especially with the incoming recruit class that they have as well, led by Donovan Edwards, the highly touted five-star coming in. Again, you know, I'm putting this out there in the early, but I think he could be my potential pick for who the team would name their starting running back, if not at the very least a backup, you know, one of the top two backups by the time the season starts. That's how confident I feel between him and knowing that uh, it's coinciding with Mike Hart's hire. That could lead into a, a, a chemistry building situation. But for now, that's just my, my feelings on, on that as well. All right. Frank, what say you? It's been interesting that Charbonnet decides to transfer, but then again, I'm not really surprised given the fact that he had kind of fallen out of favor with Hassan Haskins kind of taking on more of a role this season. And then, of course, now with uh, Donovan Edwards coming into the fold, that's going to make the backfield much more crowded, and I don't think there was going to be enough playing time for him so he moves on and chris evans going to the nfl it's that's a little bit more of an oddity given the fact that he really didn't i think since evans returned to the team he didn't really see that much action at running back like he did when he was at michigan earlier i know he had some academic issues to clear up so that's kind of interesting i don't i honestly don't expect him to get drafted but i could be wrong on that one so we'll see what ends up coming to that one all right we have a headline to uh pass along about michigan state spartans football assistant coach mike trestle was hired as defensive coordinator for the cincinnati bearcats so the spartans are going to have to look for a new defensive coordinator yeah but i'm sure this is one they wouldn't mind searching given how he performed as their coordinator so for spartan fans i'm sure it's a good riddance and uh, they could have had him much sooner well i will say this trestle was actually not the defensive coordinator last season. Scotty Hazelton primarily mm-hmm. called the plays on defense. Trestle, I believe, was the I want to say he was the linebackers coach, and I think he may have been special teams coach as well. So I think he just wanted to go reunite with Luke Fickle, who was a good friend of his, and go coach down there. So, well, of course, I'm sure Mel Tucker's going to be looking for someone to replace him. As for who that could be, only time will tell. Right now to the Lions. Continuing with our What's Your Grade segment. Pencils down, everyone. It's time to find out what's your grade. They've hired Brad Holmes as their general manager. We'll get to Dan Campbell in a second because I've got serious analysis on Dan Campbell. But with a What's Your Grade segment, Brad Holmes, they've hired him as their general manager. I'd give him an A- minus because he's going to evaluate every single player including Matthew Stafford, no matter how great of a quarterback he's been over the past decade. Ed, we'll start with you. What's your grade? They've given him a five-year contract, Brad Holmes. Yes, it has. Um, I was going to say, well, you 
basically took the words right out of my mouth in terms of overlooking and evaluating what this roster is going to look like and what has what it stands right now. I appreciate the fact that they may even be looking into what they can get out of Stafford at this point. If they feel they can get another a year or two out of him, or at least until his contract expires, so be it. But if not, then yes, trading him would not, should not be out of the realm of possibility. As for his his hire, his history, we've gone about in detail going back to the Rams, and he seems so sold on the idea of what he can do in Detroit as well that I am a little bit more optimistic for him than others may, may be expecting. But um, let's see what he can do. Let's see what he can bring to the table. And for that, I'm going to get this one to A. All right. Ed Smith gives him a mid-range A. Frank, what is your grade on Brad Holmes? I got to give this one an A because I said last week that Holmes would be a guy I was highly interested in. This is a guy who's who oversaw the drafts of the LA Rams for the last few years. And what really stood out to me the most is, as I mentioned last week, he actually did well drafting given the fact that the Rams haven't had a first round pick since they took Jared Goff first overall. And that's saying something. That means he's got an eye to find talent in later rounds when all the big can't name can't miss prospects are gone. And I'll give you a few names that he's found. Cooper Cup, who's one of the top wide receivers in the NFL. How about Jordan Fuller? Safety out of Ohio State was a sixth round pick ended up starting this year and playing very well and that's something that the lions have not had in for as long as i can remember very with true the pre- yes with all pre- with pretty much all at least the last three regimes they've had so that alone tells me this guy has an eye for talent and he can find him now what he does with matt stafford i did point this out to you off air taylor and and i think you should hear this too it's worth noting that he's got a five-year deal Matt Stafford only has two years left, so that right. possibly tells like me that that possibly tells me that either that five-year deal is because he said to the Fords, "said Look, if you want me, if I'm going to be tasked with running this thing, I'm going to need at least five years in order to get this thing going on a path that it should be." Or they just offered him that because he wanted law, he wanted tenure and all that stuff. I would have to lean more towards the former. Maybe a little bit of the latter, but I'd say, yeah, I give this higher an A, given the fact that what he's done, what he did in L.A., I know he's never ran a whole front office before, but you have to start somewhere, so I'm giving it an A. All right, so I gave it an A-, minus. now I give it an A. We all give it an A. So, now to Dan Campbell, New Orleans Saints tight ends coach and assistant coach, a six-year deal. Wow. Now, Dan Campbell can be motivating to a team as we go to Ed and then Frank again, but he's not a playmaker because, as I read in Michael Rothstein's ESPN article about him, he's not an X's and O's guru. If you don't do X's and O's, then you're not making plays. Dan Campbell does not do that. So he's apparently he's not a smart coach, to be honest with you. If the Lions are rebuilding instead of trying to even contend for a playoff spot down the road, I'd give that hire a C-. minus. But if they're trying to contend, then I'd give it a D plus. If you were to turn to the right assistant coaches for play calling, then I'd give it at least a C plus. Ed, we'll start with you. Go ahead. Yeah, and that's the 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 the, the method, the route that you just mentioned. I'm leaning towards as well. Maybe for Dan Campbell's case, his, this is his level of expertise motivating players, making sure that they're uh, they're they're in the in the right calm and spot and moment. Uh, and maybe his job is to build up morale amongst his players because as we saw. With the last regime, players being unhappy with the coach is one big reason why Matt Patricia got fired. So I think for Dan Gamble to try to establish that first and foremost could well could lead into his known trait of being, you know, to borrow the words from your name tree, a uh, leader of men. So there's always that. And I think with knowing that that's going to be his primary focus, he has no problem turning the reins over completely to this coordinator because like you said he's not an X's no guy that's not you know that's not that's out of his league that, that's above his pay grade so he's going to rely it seems more on his assistant coaches while he's going to focus on motivating the players uh, showing the right examples in terms of establishing culture amongst other things basically trying to do what Patricia could not establish at all he's going to try to improve upon that and while relying on, on his coordinators to come up with the right plays for each side of the football so I'm going to get this one high C plus, probably not a B minus. That'll be too high of a grade. But uh, knowing where, if you can accentuate the positives 
and uh, and not focus too much on the negatives of what Dan Cameron can bring. If he is able to hit on those positives at the right spot and is a phys- and he has the right uh, offensive and defensive uh, coordinator picks in mind, then this I can see this working out very well. All right. So uh, factoring all those pros and cons in, I'll give it a final grade of C plus. Frank, what's your grade on Dan Campbell? Well, it would be a knee jerk reaction for me to give this a really low grade of a D. But when you think about it, I mean, look, I know a lot of people kind of scoff at that he's a leader of men, to borrow the line from urinating tree. But I think that there's a possibility that, as Ed kind of pointed out, that he's going to possibly delegate to his offensive and defensive coordinators and let them call the shots, and he's going to be kind of like a CEO type. I mean, that's that's something that Matt Patricia was not. And again, Campbell kind of, I know I've heard that he's kind of a hard ass, for lack of a better word, but he's not like, but he's not going to be like Patricia was and make guys practice outside when there's snow and cold and all that stuff to prove how tough we are. And like I mentioned with Holmes and his contract, Campbell's contract is six years, which also tells me that he said to the Ford family, I'm going to need this much time in order to get this in the right direction. So maybe this is a case where you have somebody different in who's going to do things differently and finally get the lines back on the path they should be. Or it could very well blow up and he gets lionized like many a coach before him. I'm going to kind of find a middle road and give this a C plus. But like I said with Michigan's hires as their defensive coordinators and other coaches, there is an opportunity for this grade to get higher up and better with results. And that's really going to depend on roster construction, the draft, and eventually come a next NFL season, how they do in games. But of course, bear in mind, anyone listening to this, we've said that this might take five years in order to get back. So there could be some years where the lines are going 2-14, and 3-13, and 13, and but that's not necessarily going to be a bad thing as they're going to be getting draft picks and getting assets in order to build the team back the way it should be. And as for Matt Stafford, I still firmly believe you got to trade him to someone who needs a quarterback. Probably Indianapolis should be one of Brad Holmes' first calls, get Chris Ballard on the phone because they just lost their starter today after Phillip Rivers retired. Get him on the phone and say, hey, got Matt Stafford and we'll take a first-round pick and maybe a mid-round pick in another year or something like that. So that said, the Campbell hire, C, with an opportunity to be better with results. All right, we'll give it a C-plus for now. Okay, then they hired Saints defensive backs coach Aaron Glenn as their defensive coordinator to replace Corey Unlin. Ed, we'll go to you again, and then we'll go to Frank. Ed, what is your grade on Aaron Glenn? Uh, My grade would be eh, probably a C-plus as well because it shows that Dan Campbell is bringing along, as expected, bringing along some of the coaches that he knew best for certain spots. So he knew him obviously going back to uh, their ties together in New Orleans, but knowing the fact that New Orleans has not been known for having the most efficient or strong that strong performing of a defense as of late in several years, whether it be giving up points or yards per game, has me a bit hesitant. But for now, again, this is more so based on what do we see now with potential to, to change later based on projected results. So I think it's give this one a C-plus as well. If you think about it, this situation in terms of Campbell being the raw raw guy type of thing, but let the coordinators handle the play calling. It reminds me of Brady Hulk in a way, so I just wanted to bring that up uh, in terms of a bit of comparison. If any of this sounded familiar to any of our listeners. Yeah, that's a good question. Frank, what's your grade on Aaron Glenn? I'm giving this one a C as well. I mean, granted, I know that Campbell's trying to bring somebody who he's familiar with and who he's worked with in the past kind of help ease that transition into being a head coach. But I also have to consider the fact that the Saints aren't what you'd call a a defensive bulldog, especially their defensive backs. I mean, I know he's worked with some decent guys like Malcolm Jenkins, Marshawn Lattimore, to name a few. But it'll be interesting to see how this goes. So I'm going to give it a C for now with the opportunity to get better with the results. All right. Ed graded a C plus. Frank Gray in a mid-range C. I'll give it a C plus. 
just to help it out a little bit. So that is it for a What's Your Great segment brought to you by the Vigit app. Download the uh, Vigit app for sports fans. Sign up with a referral code STABLES for STABLES Media, capital S in the lowercase b in the middle. Again, Michigan users can pre-register with Vigit's newest and first partner, BetMGM, and deposit a minimum amount of $10 in exchange for 2,000 extra Vigit coins. Sign up with a referral code STABLES and take advantage of this opportunity. So one more uh, note to... Uh, pass along to you uh, before we transition to the Red Wings. The Lions have just interviewed Baltimore Ravens quarterbacks coach James Urban for the offensive coordinator position according to the NFL Network. We'll go to Ed and then Frank again. Ed, the Baltimore Ravens uh, seem to provide have provided uh, a ton of offense, uh, especially with Lamar Jackson. Ed, go ahead. Yeah, um, it helps when your um, head coach is the what little brother of excuse me one second this is the michigan this is the michigan hire correct no this is the oh, lions my apologies michigan uh, uh, lions hiring an offensive coordinator well again with the ravens coach uh with the ravens with what they brought up with lamar jackson again as a primary example uh but not only that but guys like jk dobbins as well and of, of course marquise hollywood brown uh his contributions as well those players alone helped but again it helps when you have a coordinator calling the right spots the right place so depending on what they do with Matthew Stafford versus potentially getting a new quarterback going forward has my potential room grade to grow. But for now, I'll give this one a B minus. All right. B minus it is. Frank, what's your grade on James Urban? Now, they haven't hired him yet, but they've interviewed him. We'll grade him anyway. I'll give this a B minus, obviously, with the opportunity to improve with the results. I mean, given the fact that he's helped uh, play a role in Baltimore being one of the best offenses in league and kind of learned under Greg Roman, who is an offensive coordinator who is widely respected. So kind of branch out from that. I'm not saying that the Lions will run that same type of offense, but there's probably going to be a lot of similarities. Obviously, it will ultimately depend on personnel because Baltimore, like I'd mentioned, has some really nice pieces on offense. Everybody knows about Lamar Jackson. He mentioned J.K. Dobbins, Hollywood Brown. But they also have, have one of the better tight ends in the league in Mark Andrews, or Mandrews, as he's more affectionately known as. So I think the, if they were to, let's say they do bring Urban in as the offensive coordinator, you've kind of got your tight end in T.J. Hawkinson. Now, obviously, you're probably going to have to get a different quarterback if you decide to move on from Stafford. And then you've got your running back in DeAndre Swift, and then you're probably going to end up having to look at at least a wide receiver or two if you want to make your offense similar to what they have in Baltimore. So let's say they do hire him. I'm giving this a B- minus with the opportunity to improve with results. But again, we'll see if they end up going this route or if they go a different way. And that is the way our What's Your Great segment brought to you by Vigit Works. Again, download the Vigit app, available on the Apple App Store and Google Play. Sign up with a referral code STABLES for STABLES Media. Capital S at the beginning, lowercase letter B in the middle. Take advantage of this uh, $10 deposit, plus in exchange for 2,000 extra VIG coins by uh, pre-registering with Vigit's first and newest partner, BetNGM. So, uh, that's all football. Now, we transition to hockey. The Red Wings start 2-2-0. Two, two and oh. First game, they uh, fell absolutely flat, getting shut out by the Carolina Hurricanes in the uh, season opener at Little Caesars Arena, 3-0. They were outshot 42-14, but uh, that really pissed off Jeff Blaschel because even he knew then his job was on the line from the get-go. And then two nights later, they beat the Carolina Hurricanes 4-2. Robbie Fabry, a game-winning goal and an assist. Dylan Larkin, two goals. Philip Zadina with two assists. And Bobby Ryan with the first Red Wing goal of the season. Jonathan Bernier with 29 saves. And then the Red Wings split their doubleheader with the Columbus Blue Jackets. They lost the first one 3-2 in regulation. Bobby Ryan with two goals. Thomas Grice was in net in both their losses. But uh, Jonathan Bernier is off to a 2-0-0 start. They beat the Blue Jackets in overtime 3-2. Bobby Ryan scored yet another goal. It was uh, off the draw in the first period. Bobby Ryan's got four goals in the first four games of the season and in his last three games. Yikes. But Tyler Bertuzzi got the game-winning goal, assisted by Dylan Larkin. As I saw on Fox Sports Detroit, Elvis Merzlikens made the save on Dylan Larkin's shot. It ricocheted 
off Mares Lincoln's and then off the shaft of Tyler Bertuzzi's stick and into the net. That was definitely a good goal, no doubt about it. Red Wings uh, obviously off to a better start than how we've anticipated. Ed, we'll go to you and then we'll go to Frank again. Ed, the Red Wings have fought harder than the uh, first game of the season and that's something uh, we didn't expect. Ed, go ahead. True, uh, but I think it shows... A, the character that's being established by having some of these players, older players around for these young players to look up and emulate, that's number one. And two, I think also this is an example of Dylan Larkin, his medal being tested, being put to the early test, I should say. No, everyone knowing he's just been named a captain, I think he's going to get tests of many varieties from different directions. Uh, we saw him just get into a fight in a game just recently. That's one example. Another example would be him leading the way with two goals in one of the recent wins. Another example could be him would be uh, instead of scoring but still coming up with two assists uh, that proved value uh, valuable to the team winning that game and we saw we see how that effect can have on the rest of the team how that shows and hey, your captain is leading an example what are you doing to contribute and you're seeing guys like Anthony Mather and Tyler Bertuzzi step up your young core that needs to show they can carry this team that was a prime example of what they did um, against Columbus the other day with, with that victory so that's one good example of knowing that hey this team may not be exactly where we wanted to be right now but there is show there is signs of promise definitely showing without a doubt yeah frank your thoughts on the red wings 2-2-0 start thus far well, I'd have to say that it's gone better than what I would have expected. But I think uh, that we can say that year two of the Eiserman era is kind of about where it should be. I mean, we see the guys who have been around that are came to the organization as young players. They're getting better. Dylan Larkin, I think, is playing better now that he's got that C on his sweater because he realizes that he has to be a leader for this team. But it's guys that Steve Eiserman has brought in. Bobby Ryan, four goals and three games played. He stepped up very well, and I've been very impressed with him. And, of course, I mean, goaltending, I mean, I could I could be nitpicky and say that Thomas Grice hasn't done very well, but I will say that he was the sole reason why they didn't get completely blown out on their opening night. He ended up keeping them in the game. It's just that he wasn't hasn't gotten a lot of goal support. Only two on Monday, but gave up three. Jonathan Bernier has played very nicely as well. Obviously, it's only four games into the season. There's still a lot of hockey left to be played. They got to play the Blackhawks this coming Friday. But I would say, yeah, eight thirty. But I would say so far that. Things are going fairly decently. And you know, as Ed brought it up too, Jeff Blaschel may realize that, hey, my ass is on the line. We got to start being better. I got to start being better. And I mentioned it too. Yeah, you mentioned it too, Taylor. That maybe that he, he's starting to realize, okay, it's put up. Every game is going to have to be put up or shut up time. So we'll see where it goes from here. Yep. Blackhawks at United Center Friday at 8.30 on Fox Sports Detroit. And then Sunday at 12.30 on NBC. And then they uh, play the Dallas Stars Tuesday and Thursday, Tuesday on FSD, and then Thursday next week at 8.30 on Fox Sports Detroit+. Plus. So the Pistons, yeah, they got a big win against the Heat, but uh, first off, they uh, lost to the Milwaukee Bucks 110-101 to last Wednesday, and then they uh, beat the Miami Heat by 20 points, 120-100. to Four Piston players in that game, almost eight of them, to be honest, in double figures, including the returning Derrick Rose. And then they uh, lost to the uh, Miami Heat, I think, 113 to 107. But then just recently tonight, they lost to the Atlanta Hawks again, 123 to 115 in overtime. Killian Hayes, aside from all that, is out at least eight more weeks with his hip injury. No surgery required, but his reevaluation will wait for eight weeks. Ed, we'll go to you again, and then we'll go to Frank. Ed, Pistons uh, showed a lot of fight in that heat doubleheader, but um, the tank is still on. Yes, it is. Um, again, the nicest, it's nice to see some improvement of what they can do, granted for their win against Miami, um, as it was evident with their uh, both their games. No Tyler Hero due to next spasms, and for whatever reason, no Jimmy Butler. So that played uh, ex- and, uh, played uh, huge dividends into getting that win. But again, you play who you play, you know. Uh, whoever signs up, whoever puts that uniform on, gets on the floor. That's who they. That's who you play. But for everything else, you know, it's just business as usual. In regards with the tank. Yeah, absolutely. 
Frank, what say you on the Pistons? Well, I'll keep saying what I've said. They pretty much are who we thought they were. They're going to be a team that wasn't going to win a ton of games, but they were going to be competitive and just kind of really fight before petering out at the end of games. And of course, we did kind of see that earlier tonight with the loss to the Atlanta Hawks, where they had a big lead, blew it in the fourth quarter, losing overtime. But you know what? That That's going to happen. This team is on the younger side. They're going to continue to get better. It's not going to show with wins, but just give it time. I mean, Derrick Rose coming back is a big help. But Killian Hayes, I mean, look, being out eight weeks and not needing surgery, I mean, you could take that as good news because I think if he would need a surgery, he would have been done for the year. So now the door is open for him possibly to return. And, of course, obviously that's not going to help the Pistons get into the playoffs because i think they're not gonna win much between now and that eight week time frame which i believe if my math is correct would put them back around the about mid to late march best case scenario so we'll see what happens on that front if he ends up up coming back this year if they just shut him down for the year but again troy weaver's got a plan for this team you just got to keep trusting in it believe in weaver Yep, and uh, no matter how you uh, calculate it, even th- if they did have Kelly and Hayes back, it still wouldn't help them get to the playoffs, like you pointed out. That's very out. true. So, uh, Jeremy Grant, 32 points, 5 assists, 6 rebounds. So I think we can definitely agree that Jeremy Grant has been the best acquisition by Troy Weaver in Absolutely. his first year. Without question. It helps that they had that, you know, uh, knew each other going back to OKC, but uh, he's w- w- more than worked out, and then some with this signing. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, the Pistons uh, home against the Houston Rockets Friday at 7. Then they have a doubleheader at home against the Philadelphia 76ers Saturday and Monday at 7. Then they go to uh, Cleveland at Rocket Mortgage Arena to play the Cavaliers Wednesday at 7. And then they're home against the Lakers next Thursday at 7 at the Golden State Warriors Saturday, January 30th at 8.30 to begin a five-game West Coast road swing, transitioning to college basketball Michigan State Spartans men's basketball still out of the top 25, but uh, they've now had three straight games canceled due to COVID. Iowa, Indiana, and Illinois. Now they uh, are waiting until next week, Thursday, when they uh, are scheduled to play the Rutgers Scarlet Knights on the road next week, Thursday at 7 o'clock. That's a to be determined, especially knowing of how um, it's not a given if that game will even be played at this point, too. Good point. But for the Michigan Wolverines men's basketball team, still at 7th the last I checked, they uh, took a pounding uh, in Minnesota against the Golden Gophers, 75-57. to And then they uh, bounced back nicely with a win at home over the Maryland Terrapins, who weren't really that good, 87-63. to So, Ed, Michigan uh, had a bad game. They played much better against Maryland. Easy rebounding. Yeah, rebounding and taking care of the basketball. Far less turnovers in this one uh, than what we saw against Minnesota. That's what uh, led to our doom, if you want to call it that. So taking care of the ball and also at least two of your three best players stepping up and contributing, like we saw with uh, Isaiah Livers and Franz Wagner as well. So when you combine those factors and the fact that um, far less mistakes against a team that you're supposed to beat, not surprised by this, much-needed rebound, on to the next one. Yep. Frank, your thoughts on Michigan basketball? Well, with regards to the loss to Minnesota, I mean, this Michigan team wasn't going to go undefeated. So they got that loss out of their system. But here's what impressed me the most in that win over Maryland. Hunter Dickinson, who I have said is going to have his hat in the ring for Big Ten Player of the Year, because I've been very impressed with him, he did not have a really good game. He only had three points. So... People will think, okay, you stop Dickinson, you stop Michigan. Right? Wrong. They got other guys who'll step up too. Isaiah Livers, he had himself a really nice game. Franz Wagner, as Ed mentioned. And also Eli Brooks was back too, as he missed the game against Minnesota. So that return helped. And obviously, the road's still going to continue to be tough for the Wolverines. I'm not sure where. Taylor, I think you've got the schedule in front of you. I'm not sure who they will have next. I've got on my script. Okay. Purdue at 7 on Friday on FS1, and then off until Saturday the 30th at home against the Indiana Hoosiers. That Purdue game is going to be kind of interesting. What I want to see is how well Dickinson will match up with Travion Williams, Purdue's center. That will definitely be a fun matchup to watch. I mean, as for the matchups of backcourts, 
I still kind of give the edge to Michigan there, but we'll see how it goes. I think that Friday's game against Purdue should be a good one. Ed, you got anything to add? It's just another sturdy test. I want to see how, if they take care of the ball the way they did against um, against Maryland compared to what they did against Minnesota, they have a good shot. But I think this one is going to be much tougher than what we saw against Wisconsin, for example. So very much looking forward to this test. All right. So uh, one Tigers headline to pass along before we get to five questions. The Tigers have signed veteran right-handed pitcher Erasmo Ramirez to a minor league contract with an invite to spring training. So there. Now it's time for the five question segment. It's time for five questions on the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast. Question number one. Will defensive coordinator Mike McDonald and co-defensive coordinator Maurice Linguist give Jim Harbaugh's Michigan Wolverines football team enough to finally beat the Ohio State Buckeyes? Ed, we'll start with you. I can't say for certain because we've yet to see any other hire of any assistant coach in the past or now that have proven to be, you know, the essential X factor begin you know because it takes more than that more than it takes more than having a good enough defense to slow down ohio state's offense sometimes you need a good enough offense to catch to uh, to keep catching up with them as well as the right play call so it takes a a combination of factors to beat ohio state as so as of right now based on what i see you know i gotta lean towards now you know i have to pick one answer yeah precautionary first frank I'm in the same boat as that. I'm going to have to lean no until I actually see some results of Michigan's defense with both McDonald and Linguist calling the plays there. Because, look, as I referenced earlier, Michigan's actually kind of following the model of what Ohio State's done and bringing in guys from the NFL to be a coordinator. But now you got to see if it's actually going to pay results. Right now, I'll say no, but we'll see how it goes this coming season. It might be more of the same song, different verse, or we could be very well saying, wow, we missed on that. Yeah, I have to agree with the both of you. Question number two, who should the Michigan State Spartans football team fine to replace Mike Tressel. Ed, we'll start with you, and then we'll go over to Frank. I could very well be one of the defensive coaches that Mel Tucker had during his time in Colorado, so that'll be my best bet. All right. As for who I would bring in, the name escapes me, but I believe it was a gentleman who was the linebackers coach at Colorado when Tucker was there. He might have been the defensive coordinator in year one of Carl Durrell being in charge, so name escapes me, but I think that's probably going to be Tucker's first call. After that it's kind of hard to say all right question number three how long will general manager brad holmes and head coach dan campbell stay in the lions organization ed go ahead i think they're going to get at least three years we saw with the last regime you know the ford family was very lenient with them instead of firing them in the middle of a season or firing them before a season they gave them at least three years to get something done they did not i think we're going to see the same type of amount of patience being shown here with this group they're going to get at least three years uh, to see what, what they can do. If they're, and based on what, whether or not there's a level of, of marginal enough improvement, we'll go from there. But for now, I'm going to say at least three years, even though I know it's a five-year deal for one and six for the other. Same situation with Quinn Tricia. Frank? I'm definitely leaning more in the three-year camp, but wouldn't be surprised if it's more like four again i still believe that both campbell and holmes have told the ford family that this is going to take a lot of time to do it's going to take at least five years so i'd say probably in that three to four year range is where by then results had better be being shown they better be good enough otherwise it's going to be adios for both of them so i'll say three to four years all right question number four Will defenseman Danny DeKaiser and center Franz Nielsen be on the move from the Red Wings organization in the near future? Ed, we'll start with you. Uh, With that contract, I don't know. With both guys, it's really hard to tell. I'm going to lean towards no because if their contracts were a little bit cheaper, yeah, but at this point, I I don't see that happening. So I think Eisman's going to have to bite the bullet on this one and let each of their – just have them both on there until until their uh, their deals run out. Well, keep in mind, they both don't have no-movement clauses. Right, so that's kind of moot. Yeah. Frank? If I had to pick one, I'd say Nielsen because he only has one more year left on his deal after this season. And I believe his cap hit is a lot, will drop. I believe his cap hit drops into about the $1 to $2 million range. So if they were to use a buyout, it would basically just be a drop in the bucket. Data Kaiser would probably be a little bit tougher to move on because his contract carries a little bit more. And I think the term is either the same as Nielsen's or 
there might be another year there, so we'll see what happens. I don't know if Steve will use two buyouts on guys, given the fact that he's already paying money to Justin Applicator after that buyout. So I think Nielsen's probably more likely to be a goner to Kaiser. I'm going to say wait and see and see how the rest of the defensemen play out and if he ends up bringing in somebody else via trade or waiver claim. That's my thoughts. Right. Spot track and cap friendly will uh, tell you all the details. Question number five When will the Spartans men's basketball team return to action? Ed, we'll go with you again. Uh, based on how things are currently going, I'm going to say at least another two weeks. I think they're just trying to see who else could be infected or potentially could be infected, who's got a quarantine, who doesn't. And when you factor all that in, I think it's going to take at least another two, maybe even three weeks to sort all this out before everyone is safe enough to say, to say hey, Okay, you're good to play. So this will go into next week, I believe, and I think at least the week after that, for sure. All right. Frank? Yeah, I'm going to have to go two weeks as well. I think recently I said that two uh, support staff members and one player had tested positive in the recent round of testing. So I'd say give it another two weeks and see if things clear up by then and hope that everyone who does not have it continues to social distance, wear a mask, wash their hands, and do all the stuff that they need to do. Yep. So that is our five question segment, and that is our episode. Before we go, I wanted to give the shout out. I want to give a shout out to Joe Men, Lisa Diaz, and Cam Parsons on their new show, Hustle and Grind, coming to Stables Media February 1st. Also, we want to remind everyone to download the all new social sports app called Big It, which influences more and more people to love sports. Enter the referral code Stables for Stables Media when you sign up. The capital S at the beginning and the lowercase letter B. In the middle, available on the Apple App Store and Google Play, Michigan users can pre-register with its first and newest partner, BetMGM, and deposit a minimum amount of $10 in exchange for 2,000 big coins. Download the Vigit app and sign up with the referral code STABLES and take advantage of the opportunity. Gentlemen, excellent job as always. That concludes another fine episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Staples Media. We'll be back next week. For Ed Smith and Frank Bajner, this is Taylor Phillips signing off. Follow me on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at DT2Phillips. Follow Ed Smith on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at EdSmith313. And follow Frank Bajner on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at Frank underscore Bajner. Thanks very much for listening, downloading, and sharing. And remember, the truth is out there. TTFN, ta-ta for now. Power to the people. Hit up with a high and we rest our case. Stay safe. The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers, nor does it represent or compete against any mainstream media in the state of Michigan. It is also not for entertainment or debating purposes. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And it is for every sports fan's own good because the truth is out there. (laughs) 